Hello, I'm Ian Solomon, Dean of the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. Thank you for tuning in to Grounds to Listen, a podcast where we have conversations with leaders, scholars, change makers about their experience with crossing boundaries in our diverse and divided world. I am thrilled today to be joined by one of the greatest minds on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and a good friend and colleague, Melissa Thomas Hunt, the John Forbes Distinguished Professor of Business and a Professor of Public Policy at the University of Virginia, um, a dear colleague on the Batten School. Melissa, Professor Thomas Hunt, former head of global diversity and belonging at Airbnb, um, a former vice provost at Vanderbilt University, um, a beloved teacher by your MBA students, your undergraduate students, um, probably your PhD students as well. I haven't, they haven't <laughs> heard from them yet. Um, and a uh, great member of the Charlottesville community. Thanks for making time to be with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. In. How's your spring going? It's good. You know, it's, it's hectic. You know, always stuff to do with 700, you know, MBAs and then, you know, engagement at Batten. So, so your current good. job is running the MBA program here at Darden? Running the residential full-time MBA, which has about 350 students in each of the two years. Yeah. And what do you hope for them? Oh, wow. So I hope that they become thoughtful, um, inclusive leaders who advocate for people, who start businesses, lead businesses that ultimately um, make society better, either because of the ways in which employees get to partake um, and earn or because of the products and services that they deliver. But I want them mostly to be thoughtful, to learn to trust themselves um, and to bring others into the conversation so that they can make the best decisions possible. Thoughtful, inclusive leaders. I like that. And that's a topic of, of your new book, <laughs> Inclusion Unlocked, a guide for leaders to act. Um, and you emphasize action in this book. In yes. fact, you start with a great quote from Rabbi Hillel yeah. about, you know, uh, if not now, when? Right. And That's I assume right. action is part of what you're inspiring these students here to take up. It is. We can spend a lot of time thinking about things, pontificating, sort of arguing back and forth. But ultimately, we have to do, we have to act. That's where change comes from. That's how we make things better. Um, and so, but we can get paralyzed. And, and think that other people are the ones that are going to act. And what you know, I want for leaders to understand is to be a leader means that you have to act. Um, with the guidance advice from a diverse set of um, actors, but you, know, they, you have to be willing to make the call and model that behavior for others. So speaking of modeling, um, in the dedication here, you talk about your parents as creating the foundation for you to pursue inclusive leadership. Yeah. Can you talk more about your parents and how you got into this work? Yeah. Um, so my parents are both educators. Um, my father actually went into educational administration. Um, his first foray into administration, he was actually leading a cooperative college akin to a community college. Um, and he would travel. And then his next job, he was at the state university, but he would travel around looking for students to provide them with educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mother I was a Title I teacher in the New York City school system, and she taught um, essentially remedial math. Mm. She taught in a trailer outside parochial schools. And so even though I didn't understand it, they did not often give voice to it when I was a little kid, as we would travel with them you know, on our vacation days, we fundamentally understood, and I say we, my brother and I, that they were providing access to people who otherwise wouldn't have had access. Mm. Um, and they held high expectations, both for those students and certainly for my brother and for me. Um, but I think they modeled that you could have high expectations and also provide support and provide entry and a, you know, a path to doing better and learning more. So that, that was really impactful. And so for me, that's the ultimate in, in inclusive leadership. They paved the way, they modeled the behavior, they did, it was small acts, mm. um, not, you know, huge acts of, you know, giving of treasure, but more of time and philosophical and imbuing in my brother and I, the same philosophy that we can pull forward. And then you went off to, to Princeton um, and you studied chemical engineering. I did. That right? I did. Um, that, so studying chemical engineering was the hardest thing I ever did. 
um, in part because the engineering program when I was there was very theoretical. And while I can do theory, and I do do theory, I tend to move from applied situations to the theoretical and back. Um, and that's not how the program was, was structured. Um, and so I actually didn't start as a chemical engineer. I started as what they called EECS, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Um, but I, ha I really, at the time that I was in school, which is you know back in the dark ages, <laughs> I really didn't have a good understanding of what the computer science part of it was. I didn't, you didn't just Google it to find out? <laughs> I didn't just Google it, right? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't pull up my cell phone. Um, and so I didn't understand, and I really learned this from my middle child, that computer science is really about solving, it's a tool to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And if I had understood that, I think I might have actually been really engaged and pursued the computer science part of it. I had been on the electrical engineering and I'll just say it didn't take really well, um, but I, I didn't want to give up being an engineer. There was something, you could call it like ego hubris, like I wanted to demonstrate that I could do it. But I went back to like sort of my high school foundation. I loved chemistry, and so I decided I was going to do chemical engineering. And lots of people said, so you're jumping out of the frying pan <laughs> into the fire. And I just thought, well, I at least have to like it. Um, and there are components of it that I liked but it was really, really hard. But I think finishing with my chemical engineering degree allowed me to realize that I could do anything one step at a time. I like the notion of computer science as a tool to solve problems and arguably inclusive leadership yeah. right, is a tool to solve human problems and the yes. problems of working together in a diverse and divided society. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, about how this book came to be and, and <laughs> yeah. you know, there are a lot of great ideas in here about leadership generally. Yes. Um, ideally, all good leadership is inclusive <laughs> leadership. Um, Which but, is my bias, right? So. But people who are interested in a leadership book who may not think all that much about diversity, equity, That's inclusion, right. and belonging. This is yeah, for them. This is a book that, that, that they yeah. can go do a, a, as a resource for how to, how to lead more effectively. That's right. Uh, Absolutely. And that was intention. It was by design. We certainly wanted to make sure that we um, were inclusive in the topics and that we touched on issues of diversity and inclusion, equity, belonging, connection. But we really had this as a book that any leader could pick up to be more effective, to connect more deeply with their teams, to understand the marketplace and, and the horizon and what their obligations were from a societal perspective. So it was meant to be a broad-based book. Now, the the field of DEI or DEIB yeah. um, it's had a, quite a journey over the past few years. I mean, it's yeah. longer than that, but if yeah. we think about the, the politics around DEI, you know, in yeah. May, June, 2020, yeah. every organization in America was yeah. getting out their DEI statement and figuring how they were gonna change their boards, how they were gonna change their hiring. Yeah. And here we are in the spring of 2024 and people are running scared from the whole concept of DEI. Yeah. What do you make of this DEI in our politics, DEIB in our politics? I'll, I'll start back in 2020. Um, I think those of us who were actively, consciously doing the work then had a sense that the other shoe was going to drop at some point, right? That the pendulum was going to shift in the direction. And that while I, I don't want to say, I mean, certainly some of it would be what we would have called performative. I don't think the vast majority was. I think it there was a realization that things were not what they had seen to be, um, and that individuals who were largely unaware of the way that individuals with from historically marginalized communities, the troubles that they were having, like there was a pulling back of the curtain and people you know, became aware of that and felt like they had to do something. But I think the, um, the doing something was both sort of in the moment and they also realized they had to do something because other people were watching, right? And over time, in the absence of sort of sustained attention um, that people can't look away from, we couldn't deny what happened in May of 2020 to George Floyd, that there are, the business creeps in, the demands of being a CEO, of being a chief people officer, like it's all encompassing. And when, when the pressure is not there, when the repeated acts are not there and visible, it's really easy to not keep focus on them. 
So it's easy to, to not keep focus. It's hard to keep focus. What do we, yeah. what do you suggest for those of us who care? Yeah. But yes, all of us, every, every sure. executive you've trained yeah. and, and worked with yeah. has a million so, priorities. Yes. And so, so, but then you asked about our particular time now, right? So I described a phenomenon of, of leaders and executives being busy, right? And having to attend to the nature of their business. I think that there are other currents of individuals recognizing um, it, it, it sort of, so power and control is not, you know, something in, in an to to our society. But I think that there are individuals who recognize that there are ways to mobilize people. And one of those ways is to dig a little bit at the, or a lot, at diversity, inclusion, and equity. And the realization is that people are feeling as though they have less than they've had in the past. People are feeling threatened. And I think we talk about that. The piece that's sometimes talked about, but I don't think talked about enough, is that people are feeling isolated. Hmm. Um, and ultimately, we want to belong to something that's greater than ourselves. And in a lot of ways, the movements against the EIB are movements that are greater than ourselves. Now, the question becomes, what's the to countervailing? To find belonging in an anti-DEIB movement. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's a very human story. The question is, what are the countervailing forces? Mm -hmm. And how do we elevate that which makes us all better and mobilize and bring people together around that? And that that's a really hard question. I don't have the answer, but I'd like to work on that. But, but arguably, that is the challenge of inclusive leadership. It's is. finding some people feel isolated. That's right. Some people feel like they might have been on a path of progress and now that's taken away. Some feel like a, a lifelong entitlement has been jeopardized. That's right. Um, and, and, then, and I was going to say, and that happens in organizations, right? People who, when they look around, there are others who are like them, either from the same community, you know, who, you know, same geography, um, uh, same race, ethnicity, we, you know, we can name, you know, dimensions of difference. And all of a sudden they look around and there are more people who they think are not like them. And that's concerning because it means like how much longer are they going to get to be there? And what are the implications for the people who are similar to them and care about them? And so it, true inclusive leaders understand how you bring everybody in, how you raise the mission to a level that a diverse array of people can believe in, can see how they contribute to, can see how their skills and abilities will be leveraged toward it and how they can get acknowledged for what they actually contribute. So let's talk about some of the strategies that inclusive leaders or strategies that make up inclusive leadership. Yeah. Um, in, the, in this book, you identify, you and your co-authors identify, you know, 12, yeah. 12 core skills yeah. or habits of mind or practices. Um, are there some of those that really are most important to you, um, or, that, or that you or that you think are most important for people like me to hear? <laughs> um, so yes, um, and so I think one that maybe um, was less salient to me as I began this endeavor with my colleagues was candor. Mm. Um, and the reason that candor is because there are individuals who have historically not been represented in organizations. They don't have tacit knowledge about what the currency is, what it takes to succeed. And as they enter and they're moving through and often seeking feedback, they're not given the feedback that they need. Mm -hmm. And so when they're not, when they don't receive favorable evaluations or they're okay, or they don't get promoted or they don't get stretch opportunities, they're surprised because people have said, you're doing fine, right? And fine, like sort of bias lives in fine. Mm -hmm. um, David Thomas, who's the president of Morehouse and has been a business school dean in a number of uh, places, has a term they coin called protective hesitation. Protective hesitation is the concept that across dimensions of difference, we are afraid to give feedback because we're not sure what the reaction is gonna be from that person. And so we're probably less likely more and more afraid because we can't predict the reaction when we perceive someone as being different from us, 
So as a consequence, we often don't tell them what they actually need to do to improve. Mm -hmm. We don't tell them what they did well in, with specificity, and we don't tell them what the opportunities are with specificity. And so they think that they're doing okay. And as a consequence, when they don't get the things they're aspirational for, they think it's because you know, they, they've been discriminated against, when in fact, there could be gaps. I'm not suggesting that there's not discrimination, but there could be gaps, but no one has told them. And furthermore, no one has provided an opportunity or a ladder for them to close those gaps and also to recognize what their strengths are and really lean into their strengths in a systematic way. I think you define candor here as you know being able to speak directly, yeah. but with empathy. With empathy, yeah. Um, uh, that's, that's I think a, a powerful way of thinking about it. Yeah. How does an organization institutionalize that, yeah. right? Because many managers might find it uncomfortable to have those conversations, even if it's not across differences or not that's across right. visible differences. That's right. That's right. Um, and yet, we're not often trained very well in how to yeah. speak directly with empathy. Well, we're not. We're often not trained in the households in which we grow up to have those direct conversations. Um, and we certainly often are thinking about in our organizational lives, we're building our social capital and our relationships and we don't wanna be excluded and we wanna be liked. Um, and that if we tell this person the things that they are not doing right, we may not actually be liked. But I think what we're encouraging people, leaders to do is to go a step further. And if you care about those individuals, if you care about their development, if you center yourself on really helping them to improve, and then you communicate you know, what the gaps are, but also articulate what their strengths are and what are the things, and then offer help in supporting them along that journey, the way it's received is really powerful. People can tell when you're actually invested in them, when the feedback that you're given, well, it's always hard to get feedback that suggests that you're, you know, your current state of affairs diverges from the optimal. They can tell when the person has their best interests. Um, it's hard for me to do that, um, but in the times where, and so I try and make a practice of it. Mm -hmm. And in the times where I do it, where I'm really able to center the other individual, they've been incredibly receptive even when the feedback has been hard. Do you have advice or strategies that managers can use to have those hard It sounds like making it a practice sure. is one. Yeah. Don't let yeah. it be something that you wait till it feels good because it may yeah. never feel good. Right. Um, or, or things institutions can do, organizations can do to make it sure. easier for their managers to do this well? Yeah, so so I'll start with what can, the man, what can managers do and I'll talk, then I'll talk about the, the institutional organizational practices. So you can't start cold. <laughs> like we actually have to have relationships with one another. We have to know one another. We have to understand, you know, what mo what motivates the people we work with. What are their aspirations? What are the friction points? Not only in the workplace, but in home, because we're we're holistic people, um, and we have to care for them, right? So it starts if you're trying to build that at the moment that you now have to give some direct but empathetic <laughs> feedback. It's really hard to build. I have done that poorly at times. So, so managers recognizing that relationship, building relationships mm. is part of the job. We often think of that as sort of the fluffy, warm stuff, not the instrumental and agentic, but actually the fluffy, warm serves the instrumental and the agentic. And so we actually have to have a practice of how we're building those relationships in authentic ways, right? Because people can tell when we're disingenuous, when we're not really interested in them. From an organizational perspective, Ideally, right, and some organizations are very, very small and they don't have the wherewithal, but to the extent that we do, we have to build a learning culture mm. and value the people who are delivering the learning. We have to teach people how to do this. It's not intuitive. And so if we have structures where, where you know, individual employees and particular managers and particular first line managers have the opportunity to learn how to do this and where the reward structure actually values that they're building relationships, that's when we will start to be, see more systematic change. What you're describing sounds so reasonable, in some ways commonsensical. You need to have a good relationship of some trust yeah. before you can speak hard things and have them heard in yeah. a spirit of, of, mm -hmm. of, of welcome. Um, and yet so many people these days are threatened by anything that looks like it might fall under the rubric of, of yeah. diversity or equity yeah. or inclusion. Um, how have you thought about um, making it safe again. I mean, you do talk about some of the, I mean, yeah. uh, what we know about psychological safety, mm -hmm. but how do we make it safe to 
just do good, good leadership, yeah. good leadership practices? It's hard. We tend to see it more when we stumble upon a leader at the top who actually who gets it, who values mm-hmm. it. Usually if we unpack that, there's something pretty um, foundational in their own narrative about a time when they may have been in the minority and the way that they were treated and welcomed in that stays with them and opens them and opens them to that and, and, and causes them to want to foster that in their organization. Um, so we have to see, we have to seize those opportunities um, when those occur. I think we have to talk to one another more. You know, when we encounter divergent perspectives, we need to actually stick with the conversation um, and not cancel people. We need to unpack and understand why someone has come to think the way they have. Um, we have to define terms. We, we spend time defining terms because a lot of times terms get weaponized and the way in which they were intended is not the way in which they're used and leveraged. Um, I think the notion is that like none of this is like is flipping a switch. Like it takes time, patience, commitment, and ideally people at the top of organizations who are committed to it. And also, because you can have people at the top who are committed to it, when we sometimes talk about the messy middle, and the messy middle has a lot going on. They're accountable for a lot of deliverables and results. They're, you know, trying to, you know, leverage their teams. There has to be a way for those at the top who understand the importance to bake that into the accountability structure for those who are in the middle so that those sort of, you know, at the base and employees actually are feeling that. We know that first line managers matter a lot Mm. um, in individuals' experience of belonging. And we know that belonging for employees is linked to their productivity and their desire to stay at companies longer. I think it also requires some degree of humility. Yes. Recognizing that this yes. is often hard yes. and uncomfortable. Yes. And we come at it from very different places. And yeah. I don't know what you experienced growing up or what you experienced right. coming into the neighborhood you live in. Um, and I think it's sometimes hard for leaders to feel comfortable showing their humility. That's right. Because yeah. we have a model of leadership oftentimes right. of someone who's know it all. And know it all. Absolutely. We have a chapter that talks about cultural connectedness. We easily could have named it cultural humility because it's the notion of you don't you don't know everything about the world about others that you are going to make mistakes um, and that in making the mistakes it's really about how you recover from it um, how you apologize for it how you seek to do your own learning and then come back to verify Um, but cultural humility is very important a very important component of inclusive leadership Mm. for your business students here at Darden or your leadership and policy students at the Batten School, what advice would you give them as they start on their leadership journeys, either in the corporate sector, in the government sector, nonprofit, wherever they go, if they aspire to, they like what you say, they're optimistic for themselves about about, about demonstrating and exercising a type of leadership that will be inclusive and will lead to positive outcomes for society, what advice do you give them? put themselves outside of their comfort zone. It's really easy, particularly when we're stressed with workloads, be it in school or outside of school, to sort of retreat to that which is familiar, for them to actually engage with the the broad array of individuals um, who are in our workplaces, who are in our schools, um, to not just surround ourselves with people who are ideologically similar to us, but to actually learn more from people who we perceive as having different approaches, different perspectives, to understand how they came to that, to understand, ask them questions about their family background and how they came to be where they are. Um, They may not end up agreeing, but you discover a humanity. Mm. And if we discover one another's humanity, then there are bridges that can be built. There are things that we can agree upon and there are paths that allow us to move forward. So part of that is being curious. Part of it is being patient. The other side of that is being willing to share a little bit about themselves. Mm-hmm. I think we often come to particularly you know, elite environments and we're buttoned up and we don't want anyone to know those other things about us. And I think the things that people love about us and why they come to like mm-hmm. us and respect us is because they know a little bit about who we actually are. Mm-hmm. 
And so we can share it. We don't have to share it all at once or all the, all the dirty laundry, but a little bit so that people can know us and can understand. Some of the leaders that I've admired most are those where you can sense their humanity. Yeah. Sometimes they share it directly, sometimes you know it in the news, but that's right. the, 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 their vulnerability, the rawness, the, the pain they've suffered. The pain, that's right. And their willingness to work at it, right? And work to be better and to acknowledge it and to learn from it, all of those things. And I imagine that is what inclusive leadership is. It is a work at it, get it better. I'm not sure there's a perfection out there. It's a no, process. No, this is a practice. It's a, um, it, it's a process. It's a journey. I think anyone who declares himself an inclusive leader, like, they're, they're, headed towards, they're headed towards failure. Um, it's a continuous learning journey, which is hard. We like to accomplish things. We like to declare that we have mastered. This is just one area where the, the mastery is an ongoing endeavor. Well, thank you for your contribution to that endeavor oh, um, for many of the students here at UVA and for readers and past students and people who will benefit from your, your thoughtfulness and your insights in this area. It's great to have you as a colleague, great to, great to learn from you, and uh, let's go make some good trouble together. Absolutely. I love that. Thanks, Thanks for so joining much. Grounds to Listen. Hope you've enjoyed hearing from Melissa Thomas Hunt, professor here at Darden and the Batten School at University of Virginia. Um, she'll also acknowledge her, her co-authors, I guess, Dev Modi and Mark Woods. Um, um, and hope you will take these insights, but most importantly, act on them. <laughs> take care. Bye.